If you've been on a trip outside the country, when you come back to Canada, border service agents will ask you a series of questions. And one of those questions will be whether you're bringing back any food, plants, or animals. And there's a reason for that. If you introduce a foreign species to a new environment, even by accident, it can wreak havoc on the ecosystem. On this episode, we talk to a scientist who's been dealing with one of these foreign species. What kind of insect is black and white, about the same length as your thumb, and likes to get around by hitching rides on your car? Well, we're about to find out. Welcome to a new episode of Simply Science, the podcast that talks about the amazing scientific work that our experts at Natural Resources Canada are doing. My name is Joel Ull, and joining me is my lovely co-host, Barb Usina. Barb, how are you? I'm doing just great today. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's so nice to be back and recording podcasts. It's, uh, it's one of the favorite parts about my job, for sure. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I just want to bring up some exciting new changes here at Simply Science. And if you've checked out our website lately, you might know what I'm talking about, but we've updated our website and we have brand new social media channels on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and as always, YouTube. So if you haven't seen them, I urge you to check them out. They're, they look amazing. Like I, I think the whole team has done such a good job with these channels and I'm really happy to be part of them. Oh, they look absolutely amazing. You're right. Um, so, Barb, today we're going to be talking about the Asian longhorn beetle. Are you familiar with this insect? Uh, you know what? I have true confession here. I've never heard of it before, and I've never seen one of them before. So this is all new to me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. That's good. That's good. Well, you're going to be learning. I feel like I'm coming into the uh, this episode with a little bit of an advantage. My kids are a big fan of the the Kratz Brothers, the Wild Kratz TV show, uh, that's, uh, that's on Netflix. And basically the Kratz brothers, what they do is they teach kids about all sorts of animals. And I recently saw an episode on the Asian longhorn beetle. So I do see myself now as an expert having watched those 22 minutes. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I don't I, know uh, what our guests would have to say about that, but you know, I'll let you get away with that. Well, 22 minutes, like 30 years of experience, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of close. Uh, so you know what why don't we bring in our expert in that uh you know that way we can end the episode both of us being experts on the insect what do you say sounds great i'm really looking forward to this okay let's do it joining us today is taylor scar from the canadian forest service taylor how are you i'm well thank you you have many years of experience dealing with the Asian longhorn beetle, which is an insect that feeds on certain types of trees. Can you explain to us what are Asian longhorn beetles, where they come from, and why is there such an interest in it in them? The Asian longhorn beetle has a very large black beetle with white spots on its back, sometimes uh, called the starry sky beetle because of that coloration. And the name longhorn comes from having these very long antennae that reach almost back to the uh, full length of the body of the insect. And then some of the males, it can actually be longer than the insect. The insects are large, robust, fat beetles, and they attack hardwood trees. They're native to uh, Asia, particularly China, which is where the infestations in North America seem to be coming from. And these beetles attack several species of hardwoods. They really like maples, also willow, poplar, birch and uh, 20 or 30 other species of trees that they will attack. And uh, they bore into the tree, the larvae bore into the tree, uh, feeding under the bark, and then move into the center of the tree. And that hollows out the wood, creates tunnels in the tree, and weakens the tree, and eventually cuts off the water supply and the food supply movement in the tree, and eventually the trees die. Wow. Now, um, you mentioned that they're very large. I'm wondering if you could give me a sense of just, just how large are they, and, and like, would I recognize would I recognize it in my backyard if I saw one? You would probably be startled if you saw one because of the size and the black shiny body and the white spots on its back. Um, we have a native insect, the white spotted sawyer, that looks similar. It's a black beetle with long antenna that attacks conifers, and it has a single white spot in the back of the uh, 
behind the head where the wings come uh, to together. This Asian longhorn beetle, though, is much larger. Um, it makes a large hole that, uh, um, well, the Americans the Americans uh, compare it to a 45 caliber sh- uh, bullet hole. It's very, very large. And um, the beetle itself makes that hole as it tunnels under the tree. It's a round hole, hence the name for this insect is also a round-headed wood borer. So think about uh, a beetle that might be um, almost the size of your thumb in, in length, not, not, not that large in width, but a uh, very large beetle. When it flies, it has to lift its wings out of its way, the hard wings on its back, and unfold uh, a membranous pair of wings underneath. So it flies very awkwardly with these hard wings held up out of the way, and, and it flies on an angle. So it usually doesn't fly very far because it's such a large beetle. Normally, it might fly, uh, uh, say, 400 to 800 meters. If it finds a host tree within that range, it'll usually stop and start to uh, lay its eggs or feed on that tree. Well, it sounds like you could probably hear them coming uh, from behind if they were coming up behind you. They're a very uh, very special kind of beetle. Um, can you tell me uh, where in Canada have you seen uh, infestations of Asian longhorn beetles, and what kind of damage do they cause? Fortunately, we have only had one infestation of Asian longhorn beetle in Canada. Uh, there are other infestations around the world. The beetles have been um, invaded other parts of the world where they've been uh, shipped to inadvertently. So the, there are infestations in uh, in the United States, in New York, uh, Chicago, New Jersey, um, Worcester, uh, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts, uh, Bethel, Ohio, major infestations there. There are also infestations in Europe. There are around 14 or so introductions to Europe. And in all of these cases, the agencies are trying to eradicate or have successfully eradicated the insect from some of those infestations. The first time I saw this insect was in 1998 when it was found in Chicago. Um, And that that has been successfully eradicated. Um, It was found two years before that in New York City. And that uh, most of that infestation has been eradicated. It was found in New Jersey, where it's been eradicated. Uh, it's also been intercepted several times in Canada. Uh, the first interception that I became aware of was 1998 in Waterloo, Ontario, where it was intercepted in a warehouse that was importing auto parts from from China. Uh, but as recently as uh, 2000, 2019, it was found in a warehouse in in Edmonton. The infestations in Toronto. Uh, and Mississauga and Vaughan are the ones that have concerned us the most. So in 2003, the insect was found for the first time infesting trees in Canada, and that was in Toronto and Vaughan. Um, and then there was a, an aggressive eradication program led by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Uh, it was declared eradicated in April of 2013 after five years of no positive fines and no infested trees. But then again in August of 2013, it was found again, this time in Mississauga uh, and some trees as well as Toronto. And it looks like that those two infestations are uh, are really the same infestation that the Mississauga-Toronto one that was found in 2013 is a, um, a remnant of the uh, original 2003 infestation in Toronto and Vaughan, probably from beetles that were hitchhiked on a car or transported inadvertently uh, from the Toronto Vaughan infestation into uh, Mississauga. So they hitchhike on a car? <laughs> How's that? So they are strong beetles. They can hold on quite well. I mean, that's how they can fight off a predator. If a predator goes to grab them, they grab on with their feet or with their mandibles. And when it was found in 2003 and again in 2013, in both instances, it was actually found by people who spotted it on a car. In both cases, different people, different beetles, but the same detection method. And when we were doing the eradication program for the 2003 infestation, the last trees that were found infested uh, were around 2007. And in those cases, those trees were found in the front yards uh, next to driveways. And our suspicion there is that those beetles were probably being picked up in the major infestation, transported inadvertently to people's homes, and then the beetles once the car stops, the beetles fly off the car and go to the nearest uh, tree that they can they, they can attack, particularly if it's a maple tree. So, wow, they really are <laughs> world travelers. I guess hitchhiking on cargo and then you know, hitchhiking on cars to go around. How do they normally spread, though? Are they a fast-spreading species? Are they more slow? 
the introductions are usually by people, of course. It's usually um, wooden pallets, uh, wooden crates that are used to transport goods. Not usually infested wood like trees themselves, but when the trees in, say, uh, in a plantation in China are uh, growing for uh, use for wooden pallets or wooden crates, or in the case of some of the trees are being grown to reduce the uh, desertification in China of the Gobi Desert, so they were planting trees that turned out to be hosts for this beetle. When those trees were then, if they were cut and used for making wooden pallets or crates, then they inadvertently got shipped around the world in infested material. So if you're looking at something like auto parts, you're not, as an inspector, looking for beetles or fungi or other things. You think, well, it's auto parts, what do I need to worry about? But it turned out that the uh, material that the the goods were being shipped in was actually infested. And so that really had to change the way we do our inspections around the world, that don't just look for soil or plant material when you're doing inspections. Look at the commodity, not the commodity itself, but what it's being shipped in to see if that's infested. So that's how the long-range transport can move this insect around. People can also move the insect around in things like firewood or pallets. Uh, people, if they take the pallet, say, from uh, from a city area, from an urban area, and take it to their cottage and use it as a bridge for over a stream, that pallet may actually be infested. Um, or if they take firewood, you have a tree die in the yard, and you say, oh, well, I'll take that to the cottage because I've got some free firewood, that material may actually be infested. So the governments in Canada, the U.S., and around the world are all discouraging people from moving uh, those kinds of infested materials and from moving firewood and saying you should uh, buy it locally and burn it locally and not uh, not move firewood because you may be moving infested material around. The beetles themselves, they can fly, as I mentioned, uh, but they take a lot of energy to fly because they're big, robust beetles. So they don't like to fly very long distances. It also exposes them to predators. Um, they'll often uh, come out of a tree that they've infested. Um, so the eggs are laid, the larvae feed underneath, the insect pupates inside the tree, and then uh, one to two years later, it emerges as an adult beetle. They'll often just turn around and reinfest that same tree, lay their eggs on the bark and reinfest that tree. Uh, but they will fly to other trees nearby. But most of the time, the catch and release studies that have been done in China and the analysis that we've done with the Canadian infestation in Toronto and Vaughan and Mississauga in Toronto show that the insect usually doesn't go more, more than 400 meters and rarely more than 800 meters. So the infestations, when you go to manage them, um, we, what we did was we had a program of cutting down the infested trees when they were found through the surveys. And then any near neighbor within 400 meters in the case of the first infestation in Toronto and Vaughan, and then 800 meters in the case of the Mississauga Toronto infestation, any host tree within 800 meters of the known infested tree, it was also cut and chipped because we know that the surveys can't find 100% of the infested trees. Mm-hmm. I imagine like the, the first line of defense is, is at, at our borders, making sure the insects don't come to Canada in the first place. But we can't always we can't always stop that. So once they get here, um, and there's an infestation underway, I, I imagine it's a bit like a solving a mystery in that each infestation is a, a little bit different. Can you tell me a bit more about the process our scientists use to eradicate this pest? So the first step then is to do the surveys. Do the once you detect the insect. We need to do the delimitation surveys to find out how large the infestation actually is and which trees are infested. So that involves uh, ground surveys with uh, trained observers that look for what are called overposition pits, which is egg-laying pits that the female beetle chews. Uh, and it's just a depression in the bark of the tree, and she turns around and lays a single egg there. And it, it, you can spot that because when it's fresh, it's lightly colored, and it darkens up a little bit but uh, as it ages. But you can look for those. You can also look for sap uh, leaking from the from the tree itself because infested trees often produce a lot of sap, which can attract um, butterflies and, and wasps and so on because when the insect is feeding out of the bark, the sap can be leaking out and that can uh, attract these other insects. And the other thing we would look for are the exit holes, uh, which are about a centimeter across in diameter. So we look for those and uh, that tells us whether or not the, um, uh, the insect has exited from that tree. That can be done both from the ground with trained observers um, looking with binoculars or just by eye. 
We also have used tree climbers that climb right up into the tree. They're trained arborist tree climbers that climb up and look at all angles from, from, uh, from above and below to see if they can spot the infestation in the tree. And also we can use bucket trucks where you put a trained observer in, in a, um, a bucket that you lift up into the canopy of the tree and look for the insect in the tree, look for the exit holes, look for the egg laying pits and see if we can spot the insect. One of the things interesting that we found in doing this work, the science that uh, the Canadian Forest Service was, um, was doing showed that the, uh, a trained observer can usually spot an infested tree within about 90 seconds. If they walk up to a tree or they're looking at that particular part of that tree, if they are going to find the an exit hole or an egg laying pit, they're going to find it within 90 seconds. If they don't find it within 90 seconds, then it's really unlikely that they're going to find it. Then they just move on and look at mm-hmm. look at more trees. So then, then when the tree cutting comes along, we cut down that tree. We examine it on the ground to see how heavily it was infested. We take those the tree back if it's infested we cut it into pieces take it back to a lab to determine when it was infested how long how many eggs were laid uh, how many eggs turned into uh, adult beetles and so on and and then we also cut down the neighboring trees and do the same kind of examination now it sounds like there was a lot of tree cutting and chipping going on and people in Canada, you know, were pretty particular about our trees and vegetation. How did people react when they first heard about the decision to cut down infested trees in, a, in an attempt to save them? Fortunately, we had the experience of what had gone on in the United States when when these uh, when this insect was found in New York and Chicago. And the experience there was that uh, if people understood what was being done and understood why, then they would much more likely to accept that the trees need to be cut. And one of the key things was that, one, you needed to be showing that you're doing things to prevent these infestations, such as border inspections and controlling um, infested material coming in from other countries. And then when you're actually involved in an eradication program, if we're telling people that we're going to restore the, um, the site, plant trees again, essentially, to replace the trees that are cut, then people are much more accepting of that. So there were a lot of public open houses and uh, public meetings, media coverage, uh, newspaper stories, and so on to explain to people what the uh, program was that was being done and why. And convincing people that, yes, that tree in that front yard or in that park is a beautiful tree and it is um, an important tree. But if we let it be infested, then it is eventually going to die and you're going to lose it. And for the sake of the rest of the trees in that neighborhood, for the rest of the trees in that city, and for the rest of the trees in the province or the um, that part of the country, then people were accepting the fact that these trees need to be sacrificed in order to protect those trees, as well as the industries that are affected. I mentioned this insect really likes maples. So had this insect been successful in escaping the Toronto Vaughan and the Mississauga, Mississauga Toronto infestations, then it could have got out into the rural forest, into the contiguous forest, affected our hardwood species, uh, really affected our maple syrup production and our maple uh, hardwood industry, and also affected our trade. Because when you uh, are when you get one of these invasive species, if you don't take aggressive action to eradicate them and they get established, then other countries impose trade barriers on us and tariffs and and non-tariff trade barriers to prevent us from shipping our material outside of Canada. So for those reasons, as well as the ecological impact of this insect, people were very accepting of this. There was some, there were some people that didn't like the idea. Uh, some people thought that we should be treating the trees with an insecticide, injecting into the tree, trying to keep the trees alive. But we opted to be aggressive uh, and move rapidly. Uh, when the first infestation was found in September of 2003 in Toronto, trees were being cut by November. It was a very rapid reaction, very rapid rapid response to get those trees as soon as possible to stop the spread of the insect. And um, and by cutting the tree and chipping it, then we know it's not infested anymore and we know it's not going to harbor those beetles. So the Canadian uh, action was to be early, aggressive, and sustained action to eradicate this insect. Yeah, it's quite a, it's incredible that we were able to eradicate it like that. Um, I'm wondering, now that, that we've taken care of that infestation, what steps are we now taking to prevent future outbreaks? I mentioned that this insect was found in 2003. 
it was probably here several years before that, at least back to at least 1996 or earlier. And in that era, then that's when a lot of the inspections weren't focusing on the, um, they're focused on the commodity, not the wood material that was being used to ship material. Now we've changed the way inspections are done in Canada and the United States and elsewhere to look for these other uh, insects and diseases that might be coming in. And in 2004, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, together with the United States, because we and Mexico, we, we often um, try to coordinate our efforts. The, those governments impose new restrictions that wood materials such as uh, wooden pallets and crates that are used to ship material from uh, infested areas like China, that they, they need to be heat treated or treated with a fumigant before they arrive in North America to keep those uh, invasive species out. And we've ramped up inspections and uh, trained a lot of people in Canadian Border Services and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to watch for these insects and diseases. The provinces are doing the same. They have uh, um, monitoring programs looking for invasive species. There are lots of agencies, non-government agencies, uh, that are involved in looking for these kinds of uh, invaders to make sure they don't come in. And then formally, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, for this insect in particular, it maintains an annual survey of various cities across Canada on a rotating basis to look specifically for Asian longhorn beetle to make sure that uh, the insect hasn't arrived somewhere else uh, and established. And that is still a, a risk, even though we've declared it eradicated this spring from Mississauga and Toronto after five years of, of uh, negative surveys and not finding it. It's still possible that it could show up somewhere else, that it's already established somewhere or that um, it's been um, re reintroduced somewhere or somebody has moved it. So we have to re uh, remain vigilant for that insect. Taylor, you've mentioned working with the U.S., with CFIA, CBSA. What other partners are you working with to eradicate the, the beetle? Whenever you get one of these major infestations like Asian longhorn beetle, they're usually so large or so significant that it's more than one agency can respond to on its own. This eradication of the uh, Asian longhorn beetle was a success because of the leadership from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, the science that was provided by uh, the Canadian Forest Service, university professors, uh, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry with the province, and the cities of Toronto and Vaughan uh, for the first infestation, and then the cities of Toronto and Mississauga for the second infestation. Uh, the cities provided a lot of the operational aspect of how to organize all the logistics of uh, cutting down trees, chipping them, hiring the contractors, the tree companies, uh, getting them involved, the arborists to um, do all that very, the heavy lifting and cutting of those trees. Um, and that also having the advice and involvement from the U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the U.S. Uh, Agriculture Research Service, and their Animal Plant Health Inspection Service were all advisors to us on how to do this. And um, we benefited from their experience and from the involvement of all the partners, uh, including us also the conservation authorities in the area too. So all those people working together were able to carry out this very um, effective and and, um, and I guess rapid in the sense that uh, in both cases, most of the tree cutting was done in a couple of years, followed by five years of surveys and a uh, very large program, very complex, but all the partners working together. So for our audience, if they would like some additional information on the Asian longhorn beetle, or if they think that they might have spotted one, um, what should they do? Who should they contact? There are lots of options for people to do. The first option is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that is uh, on the alert and has the official mandate for, for this insect and other invasive species. The Canadian Forest Service, we have uh, labs across Canada in the Victoria, Edmonton, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Quebec City, and uh, and Fredericton, where people can contact them and say and get an expert to determine whether or not they have uh, found the Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, the provinces likewise have their monitoring programs through their departments or ministries of natural resources that they can contact. There are several NGOs um, in Ontario, for example. There's the uh, Invading Species Hotline, uh, operated out by the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters with the Ministry of Natural Resources. There's also the Invasive Species Center that can be contacted. Uh, so there's lots of people that are ready and willing and able and interested in helping people identify what they found. And um, that is how I think we're likely to find it if it's established somewhere, is that somebody is going to um, 
report it after they they themselves have detected it. Uh, most infestations of this insect are found by the public. Despite all the surveys done by official agencies, most of the time it's an alert person from the public that says, that looks different than what I'm used to. Don't know if it's the native insect or the white spotted sawyer or this introduced one. I'm going to check with someone and make sure. And um, that's how I expect we'll probably find it if it's out there. Taylor, thank you so much for taking the time to come and chat with us about the Asian longhorn beetle. And uh, yeah, keep up the good fight. It's good to know that the beetle has been successfully eradicated in the greater Toronto area. Oh, for sure. And I guess it helps that it's an insect that can't really fly well. And it's pretty happy to stay put as long as it has enough to eat. But in any case, it's pretty unusual to actually eradicate an insect. So this is a huge accomplishment. And it's comforting to know that we have scientists and experts like Taylor Scar who are on the case and ready to take action if this pest ever shows up again. Oh, definitely. Um, For our audience, if you guys want to learn more about the Asian longhorn beetle, make sure to check out the links available in the episode description. Um, You can also leave a review or share this episode. And if you share over Twitter, make sure to tag our new Twitter account. It's at NRCanScience. And you can also tag our personal accounts. I'm at Joel Science. And I'm at Simply Science B. That's uh, the letter B. And uh, I might remind everyone one more time that Simply Science also has a website and a YouTube channel, which you should definitely check out and, and see our new look. We have in-depth articles and videos that showcase the fascinating science work that we do at Natural Resources Canada. And you can find those links in the episode description as well. Thank you, Barb. And I think that's it for us today. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next episode. Bye. If you like this video, let us know with a thumbs up. Click on the logo below to subscribe to the Simply Science channel and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload new videos.